Welcome to the Barnes and Noble Education Fiscal 2022 Third Quarter Earnings Conference Call. My name is Juan, and I will be coordinating your call today. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, you may do so by pressing a star followed by number one on your telephone keypad. I will now hand over to your host, Andy Millebock, to begin with. Please, Andy, go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to our fiscal 2022 third quarter earnings call. Joining us today are Mike Hughesby, CEO and Chairman, Tom Donahue, CFO, Jonathan Shar, Executive Vice President, BNED Retail and President, Barnes Noble College, David Henderson, President of MBS, and David Nenke, President of DSS. Before we begin the call, I'd like to remind you that the statements we make on today's call are covered by the Safe Harbor Disclaimer contained in our press release and public documents. The contents of this call are the property of Barnes & Noble Education and are not for rebroadcast or use by any other party without prior written consent of Barnes & Noble Education. During this call, we will make forward-looking statements with predictions, projections, and other statements about future events. These statements are based upon current expectations and assumptions that are subject to risks and uncertainties, including those contained in our press release and public filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. The company disclaims any obligation to update any forward-looking statements that may be made or discussed during this call. And now, I'll turn the call over to Mike Hughesby. Thanks, Andy, and thank you all for joining us this morning. As we entered the spring rush period, we, along with everyone else, continued to experience the ongoing effects of COVID. The Omicron variant began to spread rapidly in December and continued into January, just as schools had planned to welcome students back to campus for the start of the spring semester. Despite the continued positive momentum in our key strategic growth initiatives this quarter, COVID's Omicron surge just before our seasonally important spring rush period did negatively impact our results compared to the expectations we had prior to the surge. In early January, while a majority of our institutional partners brought students back to campus, over 100 campuses that we serve chose to conduct classes remotely for the beginning of the semester, while others chose to delay their start dates, and some schools both delayed their start dates and started classes remotely in response to the surging Omicron virus. As we have been doing for the past two years, we work closely with our campus partners to adapt and respond to the safety first policy decision many of our schools were forced to make. To support student success, we were able to quickly pivot and shift textbooks and supplies for clients that move to virtual learning where students weren't on campus as originally planned. The need to be flexible and adaptable is now a given. We are able to once again showcase the value we provide through our unique mix of digital and physical assets by customizing solutions to help both the schools and students that we serve adapt to changes with very short notice. While our teams did a great job responding nimbly to the impacts of this unwelcome Omicron surge, the reality is that this was a very suboptimal environment in which to operate efficiently, which negatively impacted our business results. Notwithstanding these and related environmental challenges during the quarter, we were able to continue the significant momentum of our key growth initiatives. First day, first day complete, our FLC partnership and its impact on our dental merchandise business, and growing our new store footprint by adding profitable new business during the quarter. Our third quarter results reflect the impacts of the Omicron curveball that COVID threw at us, primarily in lost or delayed sales for most of the services we provide and the products as we sell, including courseware, general merchandise, and school supplies. As a result of the necessary precautions taken by our institutional partners in response to Omicron, some of our rough sales were either delayed later in the quarter, pushed into the fourth quarter, or lost as store traffic underperformed expectations. As Tom will further discuss, while our third quarter gross comparable store sales increased 8.4%, when factoring in the full rush period that extended into the month of February, gross comparable store sales increased approximately 18.8% over last year's spring rush. 
despite the tremendous amount of change that's occurred over the last two years, we can now say with confidence that much of the perceived value of a college education is still rooted in its basic elements. The in-person learning and the social experience remains of extremely high value for students in schools. In the latest student voice survey conducted by Inside Higher Ed and College Pulse, when students were asked why the fall semester worked, 67% said in-person classes and 40% said social opportunities. Colleges are working hard and are motivated to bring vibrancy back to campus while simultaneously managing and responding to the vicissitudes of the COVID virus. In conversations with our partners, faculty, and students, it's clear that COVID has accelerated many of the changes occurring in higher education. The perspective is changing to a more flexible student-centric model that goes beyond solely a student's academic needs and ensures that they are equipped for success beyond the classroom. This is a paradigm change in higher ed as schools transition from the traditional question of how prepared is a student to succeed in the school to a more current perspective of how prepared is a school to meet the broader needs of the student. This change in view is being driven by a more competitive environment as enrollment demographics change, the ROI value of an education is subject to greater scrutiny, and other needs like mental health and career placement move to the forefront in supporting student success. For the non-traditional student, in greater numbers is changing the views of what defines a traditional student, the value proposition is in both providing flexibility and offering curriculum that provides an improved opportunity to elevate their lives. Understanding students' demands is critical to ensure that institutions are satisfying those demands in a more personalized way. Schools need to remain focused on developing flexible learning models and utilizing technology to achieve higher success rates, which includes retention and graduation rates while making degrees more relevant for success post-graduation. ENAD's solutions and offerings are directly aligned with these key areas of focus and help institutions identify and address many of these issues. Linked to achieving the school's primary objectives of equitable access, affordability, and improving student outcomes, our first day and first day complete inclusive access courseware delivering offerings are growing rapidly as institutions realize the benefits for their students and the school's ability to compete for students in this environment. In addition to the 65 campus stores that implemented First Day Complete in the fall term, an incremental 11 stores initiated First Day Complete for the spring term, bringing the total to 76 stores, representing an estimated undergraduate enrollment of over 380,000 students at these institutions benefiting from the program. Our teams have already secured commitments to launch First Day Complete for additional campuses in the fall term of 2022 and continue to work with a significant number of additional campuses to launch First Day Complete in academic years 22, 23, and beyond. Given the timing of when First Day Complete contracts for the coming new fiscal year are finalized, we plan to provide more specificity on our expected fall 22 First Day Complete enrollment growth in connection with our year-end earnings release in June. Beyond our current roster of institutional partners, our total value proposition, which includes our inclusive access offerings and ability to fulfill them using our MBS assets, our logo and emblematic partnership with Fanatics and LIDS, and our DSS suite of supplemental learning and study tools, is resonating with many new schools that have recently entered into agreements with us to manage their bookstores. For fiscal 22, which will end on April 30, 2022, we are currently on track to generate gross new business wins of approximately $130 million, just over $100 million on a net basis after considering expected store closings. These amounts, which are based on estimated sales using historical information, include our newly formed partnership with Notre Dame. We're excited to announce that we will begin to operate their campus bookstore system next week. Turning to our general merchandise business, we continue to experience the early benefits from our partnership with Fanatic and Lids, with gross general merchandise comparable sales growing 59% during the third quarter. The customer-facing benefits of this partnership include 
an unparalleled merchandise assortment, a best-in-class, on-the-channel customer experience for logo and emblematic products, and powerful digital marketing tools to create awareness and improve access. In addition, this truly strategic partnership also provides BNED with additional sustainable benefits to our operating model that are important to recognize and to value, such as reduced direct investment in e-commerce system development costs, marketing spend, and payroll expenses as we leverage the tech expertise, investments, and general merchandise and workforce of Fanatic to Lids. This leverage translates into both lower spend and accelerated time to market for innovation. Over $58 million in liquidity infused from the initial strategic investments made by FLC the second half of our last fiscal year. Working capital improvements, as we no longer are purchasing and paying for the logo and emblematic product inventory, a unique partner to go to market with to win significant new business like Notre Dame, one of the largest NCAA brands for general merchandise sales. Finally, the supply chain benefits of scale enjoyed by FLC that we would not command on a standalone basis. This was proven during the supply chain challenges of the past 12 months, as Fanatics and Lids have undoubtedly been able to more effectively procure supply for our stores than we could have on our own in such a challenged environment. We expect our FLC partnership to grow our general merchandise comparable gross sales and gross profit dollars more substantially and faster than we would be able to on our own, given the benefits we just discussed and our experience today. We have already accomplished much together after only one year, but we believe together that we have significant upside as we apply our learnings and progress to date to further benefit our customers, the schools, students, faculty, alums, and fans that we serve with this unique and exclusive partnership. Turning to our DSS business, our Bartleby suite of solutions continue to exhibit its solid growth. DSS revenue grew 31% to $9.4 million, with Bartleby revenue growing approximately 36% year over year. Bartleby generated over 97,000 Bartleby Gross subscribers during the quarter and over 285,000 Bartleby Gross subscribers year to date, representing year over year growth of 34%. During the third quarter, we were excited to announce a new partnership with Delgado Community College in which they implemented both our first day complete offering, and Bartleby suite of digital services for their students. In addition to ensuring all students have convenient, affordable access to all their course materials, every student will also receive access to personalized support through Bartleby's 24-7 online study platform through the Delgado course complete offering. Many of these students are parents with busy lives, jobs, family obligations, and household responsibilities. When these students are ready to get their schoolwork done, morning, noon, or night, we want to be there to help them achieve the understanding that they need to to master the material. Bartleby will be integrated seamlessly into Delgado's learning management system. Providing students with convenient access to affordable course materials on their first day of class is a foundational step in preparing them for their best opportunity to achieve academic success. But that's just the important first step. Offering Bartleby's digital suite of services with our first day complete offering ensures that students have access to the learning support they need and demand whenever and wherever is most convenient for them, learning in a much more personalized way. We look forward to keeping you apprised of our efforts to ensure all students are equipped for success from their first day until they complete their finals through our first day complete and first day digital offerings. Another third quarter highlight is an important strategic partnership that we entered into with Billie Jean King Enterprises to enhance BNED's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and programming. Our newly formed partnership with this sports icon and social justice champion will advance BNED's DEI initiatives and programming for the benefit of the employees, partner schools, students, and faculty that we serve. In addition to supporting our ongoing DEI efforts, this partnership will enable us to develop and launch new initiatives that emphasize respect, tolerance, and equity, and embrace diversity within our culture and daily business practices. These values are important to our people and our customers. 
And this partnership aligns us squarely with them on this critical element of BNED's core culture. While we continue to experience some ongoing COVID-related negative impacts during the third quarter, which is influencing our current outlook for fiscal 2023 that Tom will discuss in more detail, we have much to be positive about and to look forward to. All the current facts show that the impacts of COVID are being diluted by the proven efficacy of COVID vaccines and the response to protocols and regulatory policies that are aimed at returning us all to a more normal or at least more transparent and predictable operating environment in the near term. We believe we will have some positive prompts benefiting from a return to in-person NCAA sporting events and activities, such as the Final Four as we have come to celebrate it pre-COVID, upcoming in-person graduation celebrations, and the positive momentum of our growth initiatives that are focused on as a key to completing the transformation of our business that we've been working hard on for the past several years. I'm extremely proud and grateful to our people, our customers, and our shareholders for their ongoing support during the choppy seas we believe we have navigated through together into what most are projecting to be a much calmer horizon in front of us. And now I'll turn it over to Tom for the financial review. Thanks, Mike. Please note that the third quarter of fiscal 2022 consists of 13 weeks, ended on January 29, 2022. All comparisons will be to the third quarter of fiscal 2021 unless otherwise noted. As Mike highlighted earlier, our third quarter results, which include the start of our spring rush period, were impacted by the ongoing effects of COVID and the Omicron surge that began just as schools were preparing to welcome students back to campus for the start of the spring semester. This had an effect of delaying some rush sales into the latter part of the third quarter and into the fourth quarter. We also believe that sales within certain categories that rely on a vibrant campus atmosphere, such as school supplies and food and convenience, were lost with the disruption at the beginning of the spring semester. Total sales for the quarter were $402.8 million, compared with $411.6 million in the prior year. This decrease of $8.8 million, or 2.1%, was comprised of a $12.9 million decrease from the retail segment, a $2.4 million decrease from the wholesale segment, and a $2.2 million increase from the DSS segment. Retail sales decreased $12.9 million, or 3.3%, as compared to the prior year period due to lower course material sales and lower logo and emblematic revenue recognition, which are now reflected on a net revenue commission basis, as compared to the gross revenue basis in the prior year period, following our merchandising partnership agreement with Fanatics and Lids. On a gross comparable store basis, in which logo and emblematic sales fulfilled by Fanatics and Lids are included on a gross revenue basis, retail sales increased 8.4% during the quarter, consisting of a 4% decline in textbook sales and a 59.1% increase in general merchandise sales. Textbook sales declined on lower enrollments, fewer international students, and the decision of some schools to delay their spring semester start dates. This was partially offset by the growth of our first day complete and first day by course offerings, with revenue increasing 64% to $76.1 million during the quarter, as compared to $46.4 million in the prior year period. As the spring term extends to April and May, rental income related to first day complete and first day rental course materials are recognized over the term, and therefore a portion of the revenue is deferred into our fiscal fourth quarter. Our general merchandise business benefited from a greater number of students returning to campus, the reopening of most of our campus stores in the current period as compared to a year ago when the majority of our stores were closed in response to COVID safety protocols, coupled with an improved selection and e-commerce experience for our customers benefiting from our partnership with Fanatics and Lids. Consistent with prior years, the spring rush period typically extends beyond the quarter due to later school openings and students buying course materials later in the semester. Factoring in the fiscal month of February into the third quarter, comparable store sales for the retail segment for spring rush increased by approximately 18.8%. Net sales for the wholesale segment decreased 2.4 million, or 6.1% to 37 million, primarily due to COVID-19 related supply constraints 
resulting from the lack of on-campus textbook buyback opportunities during the prior fiscal year and lower customer demand resulting from a shift in buying patterns from physical textbooks to digital products, which was partially offset by lower returns and allowances. Additionally, during the prior year period, wholesale CSS model fulfilled direct-to-student course material orders for retail campus bookstores that were not fully operational due to COVID-19 campus store closures, whereas those sales shifted back to the campus bookstores in the current period. DSS sales grew 2.2 million, or 30.9% to 9.4 million, benefiting from an increase in subscription sales. The consolidated gross margin rate for the quarter was 21.6% compared to 17.2% in the prior year period, and our gross profit increased 23.2% to 87 million. This was primarily due to the favorable sales mix of higher general merchandise products and higher margin rates benefiting from lower inventory reserves and lower markdowns, somewhat offset by higher contract costs. Our selling and administrative expenses increased by 8.8 million, or 9.4%, compared with the prior year period, primarily due to the reopening of most stores and bringing employees back to serve the greater number of students on campus, as compared to the prior year when we furloughed many employees in response to our during the third quarter, we evaluated our store-level long-lived assets in the retail segment for impairment. As a result of the impairment testing, we recognized a $6.4 million non-cash charge. At the end of the quarter, our cash balance was $10 million with outstanding borrowings of $200.4 million as compared to borrowings of $150.8 million in the prior year period. Much like our second quarter, this increase is mostly due to the timing of receivables associated with the significant growth of our first day offerings. Schools generally remit payments for students enrolled in courses after their student drop ad dates, which occurred after the third quarter ended. CapEx for the quarter was $12.1 million, as compared to $9.7 million in the prior year. As we look to the balance of the fiscal year and our next fiscal year, while COVID-19 and its variants have had a greater than expected impact on our business in fiscal 2022, based on our current views, which include an improved outlook for campus events and activities during the spring, the company continues to expect to generate positive non-GAAP adjusted EBITDA in fiscal year 2022. While we currently believe that the non-GAAP adjusted EBITDA will significantly improve in fiscal year 2023, we now expect non-GAAP adjusted EBITDA in fiscal year 2023 to be lower than the pre-COVID levels as the direct and ancillary impacts of the pandemic, including wholesale supply issues and inflationary pressures, are expected to continue. We expect to be in a position to provide additional insight on our fiscal year 2023 outlook when we report our year-end earnings in June. Currently, our retail segment operates 1,441 college, university, and K-12 school bookstores, comprised of 799 physical bookstores and their e-commerce sites, as well as 642 virtual bookstores. With that, we will open the call for questions. Operator, please provide instructions for those interested in asking a question. If you would like to ask a question at this point, please press a star followed by number one on your telephone keypad. If you change your mind, please press a star followed by number two. When preparing to ask a question, please ensure your phone is unmuted locally. And the first question comes from the line of Ryan McDonald from Needham. Please, Ryan, your line is now open. Hi, Mike and Tom. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, you know, maybe starting with uh, Fanatics, Liz, uh, it was great to see, you know, 59% uh, growth in comp store sales there um, and, and starting to see some of the positive impact. You know, I'm curious, as you continue to roll out additional or get additional sites live on, on FLC, how, what sort of uplift are you seeing sort of as those go live sort of hit and, and, and the impact on e-commerce sales just generally? Yeah, John, I'll let John Shar address that. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan, we're, uh, we're really uh, excited about the initial results uh, that we're seeing um, in, uh, in the quarter. And since we launched uh, the sites with, the, as, you, as you mentioned, a 59% uh, increase in our uh, comp store general merchandise sales, uh, I think that uh, 
So the you know contributing both contributing factors include our in-store assortment and experience, as well as the online benefits. We're transitioning um, more sites uh, this uh, in the fourth quarter over, and we expect it to have a really significant impact uh, on. Uh, on driving increased sales uh, going forward. So very excited about the experience, the assortment, and the offering that we can bring to our schools and the customers uh, that we serve. Yeah, just one general comment on the partnership itself, Ryan, is that, you know, it wasn't even a year ago when we really started this by selling our inventory to FLC so they could, you know, take over the emblematic and logo clothing and goods business and the upside that we have really is also resident in the improvements that we're making in just the day-to-day -day operation and, and ordering. If you think back to the supply issues that were really um, prevalent in all businesses last year, uh, the timing of when we have to put orders in for the fall and that type of thing, there was a lot done very, very quickly when FLC established its leadership. Um, you know, which is now being much, much more refined in terms of representing each store, their brand, and the assortments, and how we go to market. So, just the the uh, the evolution of the partnership going into its second year soon will provide, I think, substantial upside to what we saw in the uh, in, in the last 12 months. It's really helpful. Thanks. Um, and maybe then. You know, as we look out the, at the progress you're making on the initiatives, you know, great great traction with FLC. You know, first they complete continuing to, to grow rapidly and increases a percent of, you know, the course material spend. You know, Bartleby be initiatives being really strong here. You know, can you talk about the, that in the context of some of the preliminary comments you gave around the fiscal 23 margin profile and you know, maybe why we might not be seeing uh, some of those margin accretive sort of Businesses growing as a percent of the mix, not sort of translating as much to the to the profitability or adjusted EBITDA outlook as we look into next year. Okay. Well, I think you know guidance relates to the EBITDA, not not margin specifically, but um, you know we're concerned about inflation, you know, in terms of how it flows through our our spend and the need to be competitive in a digital environment by retaining and attracting talent as part of that. Um, you know, the other pieces of that inflation go to fuel costs, what that does to our freight and shipping, and you know, we're spending a lot of time looking at pricing, how much of that can be passed through in our, our various uh, pricing models for our inclusive access and, and a la carte offerings. So, you know, the, 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 the adjustment in the guidance, whereas we said we would approach pre-COVID levels for 23 and beyond, and now we're saying uh, it's going to grow substantially beyond 22, but probably not to the level we thought. You know, when we gave that guidance, think back to June of last year when we gave that guidance, what we did not know at that time is we did not know um, some of the things that were going to be happening, obviously, in the world to affect inflation, as well as, you know, the, uh, the Delta variant, Omicron, et cetera, which you know, it does affect our jump-off point, so to speak, from 22 to 23, since, uh, you know, we just, we just, we're just going to end that fiscal year in April. The other big thing is wholesale. Um, wholesale, if you look back at our pre-COVID contributions, EBITDA by segment was fairly substantial, and that business has, as we've disclosed, been challenged by lack of supply because of, of, of buyback and also because of inability to really source books from international sources given the very expensive freight costs associated that makes it uh, prohibitive. So we're, uh, we're working hard, and Dave Henderson is on the line, and we're working very hard to get wholesale, um, you know, um, more profitable next year than it was this year. And uh, we're not giving guidance by segment, but, but wholesale is another piece of that. So this is not all around margin. This is This is really... Um, you know, it's got a lot to do with, with spend and growing, you know, growing our digital business uh, at, at, during a time of scale. Really helpful, thanks. And then maybe just one more for me, and uh, then I'll hop back in the queue. But um, on Bartleby, it was really great to see the first deal announced with Delgado Community College and, and sort of your ability to start bundling that with FDC. 
you know, can you just talk about sort of what got, you know, Delgado comfortable with, with sort of having the digital study tool integrated in and, and maybe how that affects uh, uh, the strategy around pricing uh, for Bartleby moving forward? Is it still going to be charged on a, on a monthly basis in these, in these, uh, these contractual relationships or how that's being sort of rolled in? Thanks. Yeah, I'll make one general comment, and then David Nenke, who's president of DSS, can, can answer your, your questions in, in further depth. But just in general, as we found out with selling first day complete, the key to selling any new kind of revolutionary model is making sure you line up with a more progressive, um, open-minded leadership on the campus. And I think we found that at Delgado. So that was that's one of the keys. We're very much in sync with them, and they're they're very excited about you know what the potential benefits to their students are of incorporating the the digital uh, Bartleby digital study self study suite of tools in with the first day complete program. So that's that's a big part of it. But David David can answer your other questions. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. That um, Delgado were absolutely. Um, focused on providing the best outcomes to their students. Um, they have a large percentage of their student population is part-time or non-traditional students who um, need help and support outside of core university hours. Um, and so they, as we had discussions with them, they were, they were very focused on trying to provide um, support to their students to, to kind of help ultimately with student success, which absolutely lines up with our focus and what we're um, what we're trying to do. Um, our objective kind of remains enhancing educational outcomes and um, complement the work that happens in the classroom. So um, with them, they were very open, and as we talked through our opportunities and the feature set. Um, they were very focused on making sure that they could provide you know, as many as many features as their students. I think one of the interesting things, particularly with Delgado, is um, they're also interested in you know, the reporting that comes with it and making sure that students are engaged with the tools and, and really trying to trying to support it. It's a wide labeled product and you know, LMS integration, et cetera. So we're in the process now of training the faculty and and taking them through the product. So it's an exciting time for, for us. And as you say, they were very customer focused and making sure their students um, got the benefits. From a charging perspective, which I think was the second part of your question, um, you know, the, the charging is more around uh, opportunity of seats, if you like, or student hours. So um, aligned with the amount of students that they have on campus at the time. These, is how we're kind of working through charging it rather than the, um, I guess, the direct-to-consumer business, which is the monthly subscriptions. Thanks for taking my question. Thank I'll you. Back in the queue. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Alex Feldman from Craig Halloon Capital Group. Please, Alex, your line is now open. Great. Thanks very much for taking my question. Um, you know, wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, fiscal 23 EBITDA guidance. Can, can you unpack a little bit more about, you know, where that's coming from? I, I think you mentioned, Michael, just the, the, the sheer notion of starting at kind of a lower jumping off point in the month of May, you know, still being part of this school year. Uh, you know, how much is, is that going to be a headwind versus pre-COVID and versus, you know, how much of this is supply chain issues that, that you're seeing um, versus just inflation pressures and, and, and then, you know, kind of putting it all together. I mean, is it, is it still the company's goal to get back to pre-COVID profitability in the long run? Just, just trying to kind of size up these, these, these different uh, aspects of it, if you could. Yeah, let me just start off by saying, um, uh, Alex, that, We'll, we'll be able to, I think, provide, you know, more precision around fiscal year 23 after we close fiscal year 22, which won't happen until, you know, the end of in May. And, uh, you know, we, in terms of the jumping off point, you know, one thing I will say is that, I mean, it's influenced by, I think, the fact that COVID has lingered and that that has a, that has an impact on, on, uh, on a lot of different 
thing psychologically in terms of the people we do business in the operating environment, in terms of our ability to get their attention, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, having said that, um, there, there are impacts from jumping off, but we're also pretty optimistic about how we're going to start fiscal year 23 with uh, the, uh, the FDC growth that we've had and, and the FLC partnership improvements and, you know, opening new schools like Notre Dame and going to market to capture other new big business like that. So in unpacking that, yes, I think, first off, we definitely on a, on a, a longer-term basis not only intend to get, you know, back to that level but surpass it. So the pacing of everything that we've intended, you know, if you look back at the last two years, has been slower than we expected. We expected it to accelerate financially a little bit more quickly this coming year than it's going to, and there's a lot of different factors that – that enter into that. I've tried to highlight some of them. I think we can be more specific about it, you know, as we get, you know, our year-end results closed and, uh, you know, really, really start to get into fiscal year 23 um, in a more surgical basis. I mean, right now we know we're in the middle of uh, finalizing our budget cycle for, for 23. So I think one thing is COVID has is, is taught us, and I'm not sending this as any kind of a signal, but, you know, that we do need to, you know, to be, to be cautious about our, our outlooks given the, the uncertainty that it creates and and the impact it's having. I mean, you know, this, this thing in Ukraine and its impact has a lot of ripple impacts on, on how we do business, both in retail and wholesale, both of those in particular, because we have a lot of volume still in, in physical shipments and in general merchandise physical shipments. And $130 a barrel of oil, I haven't seen the price today, but that's what it was yesterday, has a, has a big impact on, on, on our cost structure. So we're doing a lot of different things to try to mitigate that with commissions and, and labor and everything else. But labor is another big concern because we've been, we've been able to really um, retain our, our quality workforce and, in fact, add a lot of good people. Um, you know, David and DSS has done a tremendous job of attracting and retaining new digital talent, which is very, very competitive in this environment. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been able to, to keep the, the great team we have together. Um, but, you know, to, to do that and be competitive, you have to assume that you're going to have some, some increases, which puts pressure on us to move technology spend faster so that, you know, we're, we're replacing more of our our uh, our human spend with technology spend over time. So anyway, I guess the other thing I would say is that the uh, enrollment status that came out is something we didn't know, didn't really anticipate, and quite frankly, it's a projection. We start to see some optimism recently through applications that are coming through. But as you know, enrollments were hit. Um, undergraduate enrollment declined 3%. This fall from a year ago, and six and a half percent from two years ago, which is really what we're measuring when we talk about you know, pre-COVID. So even more prevalent, you know, the two-year institution enrollment declined by um, 3.4 and it's down 13 percent since 2019. So, you know, some of that enrollment um, information that came to light that wasn't known last June has had an impact on looking at, you know, our our outlook for um, this coming year. We're doing a lot to combat the enrollment decline, you know, and how do you do that? Well, the enrollment decline is a big issue for the schools we serve. So our job is to help make them more competitive in terms of getting out their message, not just against, you know, how they compete with other schools, but just the value of an education, what the ROI is on an education. And, uh, you know, so that's our mission is to try to support their their mission to get the, the value proposition clearly communicated as to why a higher ed, you know, why a higher education uh, experience and credentials is still important. So those are those are kind of the big things. En en enrollments, inflation, um, as I mentioned already, you know, wholesale and uh, you know, a lot of that we're offsetting by the growth in first day complete and what we expect to happen in general merchandise. Great. That's really helpful. Thanks. Um, and then, you know, if, if I could just ask a little bit more about first day complete, and it sounds like that is, is progressing. 
packaged very nicely and, and is probably the most important growth vehicle um, for you over the next couple of years. Are, are there mechanisms in place to start to recoup some of those higher freight rates that, that you were mentioning um, in your prepared remarks? You know, does this change kind of how you go after the next 50 or 100 schools? Um, you know, in terms of how you how you talk about pricing and and and, and the ultimate bottom line. Um, just, just wondering how you're going to be able to scale that, you know, in an environment where where you know your your freight rates and other costs are a lot higher. Yeah, that's a great question. It's something we talk about, you know, daily. Had you know big meetings uh, going into you know this this current slate of discussions around, you know, first day complete. Contractual pricing, and, and, the, and the thing is that um, you know there's a couple of elements that go into analyzing your costs, so you don't get upside down and locking into rates. Uh, it's it's the, the pricing that you're paying for content, as well as freight, and you know some other cost elements that factor into commissions and how they're structured and that type of thing. But we do have an annual pricing review. We are spending a lot of time, and John Char and his team. Uh, working with Tom, our, our CFO, and you know they actually started doing that already. Um, you know last semester, in anticipation of what we saw in terms of freight increases in the fall and in this spring. So I'll let uh, John talk about about that. But one the one thing I would say too, just to support your comment, is keep in mind that you know this this first day complete product, which is no doubt our our focus in terms of reversing a secular trend. Uh, in in uh, textbook courseware, whether it's digital or physical, declines over the last 10, 12 years, was only at you know 14 campuses supporting 40,000 students um, in the fall of uh, of 20. Then it went to 65 campuses, about 290,000 students this last fall, and you know we expect to see that continue to scale. And the point I want to make is that all that growth occurred during a really tough sales period. Very difficult to convince people to change models, um, you know, and focus on the benefits of these kinds of new revolutionary courseware pricing models. While they're so focused on on on, on COVID safety uh, tracing, testing, etc., and and just getting their attention. So, our our people in retail and supported by everyone else have done a great job selling FTCs. I think that. As I closed my remarks in the script, I said, I think we've been through these choppy seas and navigated and we have a common horizon. I really believe that, you know, barring something, you know, that we can't control that's going on in the world. But uh, that really gives me a lot of enthusiasm for what we're going to do with FDC and continuing to scale it going forward. I'll, I'll turn it to John to talk about the, the questions you have on, on pricing considerations. Yeah, uh, Alex, that's a great, great question. Um, the other thing, uh, just building on what Mike is saying uh, to um, that's a, a factor is the percent of digital content that uh, that is growing uh, each term as a percent of the mix overall and within FDC, and, ob and obviously digital content offsets any increases in inbound freight or other expenses that go into uh, the, the cost of the content. So that uh, we have a balance of some costs going up, but favorable mix shifting to digital, which is allowing us to continue to provide great value uh, to our campuses. And, uh, and overall, uh, we're really optimistic about the growth of First Day Complete, because what we're seeing is that it's really making a significant impact on student outcomes. Through three, through three sort of key pillars, um, having equitable access to content on day one, through having a, a concierge-like, highly convenient service that's really eliminating uh, a period of stress for many, uh, for many students at the beginning of the term as student mental health becomes more and more significant an issue on campuses across the country, and then affordability, which we're able to hit uh, through the higher sell-through rates and the, and the discounts we can drive to students uh, through that. So we're really making a significant impact and very optimistic uh, that we're going to continue to grow uh, the model for more and more institutions going forward. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next question comes from the line of Rory Wallace from Outer Bridge Capital. Please, Rory, your line is now open. 
Hi, Mike. It's Tom and John. I, I'm curious, and David, curious on the revenue deferrals that you mentioned in this quarter. I think from the comp being up 18% when including February, it implies that, that that was a pretty big month for you. But specifically for first day complete and first day revenues, what would that have looked like had, um, had the 100 schools not gone remote and had you not seen these sort of push, push out to the right? Yeah, Rory, this is Tom, and uh, you are correct that with, with the, the pacing of school openings and the pushing to February, uh, there was approximately $25 million of revenue that could be deferred into the fourth quarter. And that's implicit in, in the 18.8% comp set. And that, that doesn't include and that, that's um, uh, it doesn't include activations uh, for first day, first day complete. You know that may occur, you know, some even beyond then. But you know we tried to pick up as much of of, of the information we had in February, which should be fairly inclusive. That 18.8 percent growth rate um, should be a pretty good estimate of uh, of uh, of the impact on spring rush at first day, first day complete. Got it. Okay, and and so, so that was a, really a large part of um, of this quarter and, and kind of the delta versus what we thought going in a couple periods ago. And then, I guess with the with the new business at 100 million of net new, I know Notre Dame is is probably meeting full double digit millions part of that. But thinking about kind of how the company looks structurally coming into a normal operating environment, it seems like. If you can win, whether it's 50 or 100 million of net new business, you've got sort of an embedded uh, single-digit tailwind to your revenue growth, and then on top of that, you should be getting the comp benefit of first day complete and DSS and Fanatics. So it would seem like the company is is going to structurally become a much more rapid sort of top-line grower as opposed to what it's been in the past. I just think uh, you know it's, it's kind of worth maybe stating that, or or, or do I have that? that vision of the company, correct? Yeah, I think a couple of things, uh, Rory, good observations. Um, in terms of top-line growth, it also depends over what time horizon you're talking about. But as we enter this year with the new business we've disclosed, the one thing also to keep in mind is that, you know, we are, if you look at gross comparable store sales for general merchandise, you, know, you have to look at that pro forma number not the gap number in terms of top line growth, right? So that's what I assume you're talking about. That's what we would that's how we look at it. But I think the one important point to make about the new business is that I think we're being very disciplined about not just new business that we take on to make sure that it's profitable. It may not be day one, but as soon as possible from day one, hopefully, you know, no later than year year two, but in most cases immediately, um, you know, and, and insisting and in many cases, we don't take the business on unless they, they take on a first day complete model or are willing to, you know, take it on in year two. Um, we're doing the same thing with renewals for any types of accounts that have marginal profitability. Um, you know, we hate to part ways with, with long-term customers, but, you know, if, if, if they can't, and this gets back to my point about dealing with the progressive leadership, the new thinking, people that are willing to change, uh, is a big part of uh, of our success, I think, is, is having the discipline to make sure that you know we're we're not hoping that someone changes two, three, four years from now, that they're willing to do it now uh, for for renewals that are marginal. So yeah, I think we're 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 very excited about the the momentum we have. We just slowed down a little bit this quarter by Omicron in January. Uh, but uh, I think the revision of our guidance for 23 should be viewed as anything other than there were a lot of things that happened between when we gave that guidance in June and and today, many of which are very very recent, that uh, you know they give us you know some pause to be uh, a little cautious about you know about that. But we'll update that at the end of the year. We'll be more specific. Yeah, no, I, I think. Um you know, I'm sure most, most shareholders will be able to appreciate the, the reasons for, for resetting the bar. I think, you know, as far as the, the other thing I want to ask on with Bartleby and DSS, so the growth rate there is, has stayed very strong, and I think Shag is guiding to like 8 to 10% organic growth for their, for their study product. 
And it seems like that business is really hanging in and not seeing the same sort of macro impact as um, some of your competitors that have decelerated a lot. So I guess, you know, my, my question is, what are you doing better than the competition um, in, in your view, David? And then also with this Delgado partnership, is that something that's going to be easy to, to scale once you sort of have this, this use case um, sort of better, better in hand and better understood? It sounds like the, the LMS integration part of it uh, should be pretty seamless. So it's kind of around making sure that, that you have the satisfaction with that customer and that you have something that you can really scale out to, to future customers. Um, yeah, let me yeah, take David. the second part of the question first. Um, the, certainly with the uh, Delgado um, execution, what we have um, worked through is a lot of the mechanics about being able to um, turn on or off features based on um, on on what the uh, institution uh, wants to offer. So. We have built in a lot of functionality in regards to being able to do that with an aim to be uh, scalable. Um, and um, so we're kind of, at the moment, you know, continuing to kind of build our playbook, but also kind of looking at being able to, to um, implement this um, in a relatively seamless way. Um, so that's what we're focused on. I won't say we're successful at it yet, but that's, that's what we're... That's what we're working on. Um, so we feel pretty good about the work that we've done um, on the kind of framework of the business to, to be able to kind of do that. Um, the second part of the, or the first part of your question in regards to competitors, I, um, I, I won't comment on other competitors. All, all I'll comment and say is we're continuing to focus on um, you know the educational outcomes and student successes, and that's what we're we're trying to build and focus on, and, and build a robust business that um, ultimately gets to student success. So um, I think that we are having, um, you know, we're resonating well with customers. I think we're well trusted from um, both students and institutions. So we're just going to continue to focus on that, and, and hopefully focus on the long term and show success. Thanks. And how much of the, the subscriber acquisition is, is linked to retail POS at this point? I know it used to be very intensive on, on that front and then kind of went to very little, and I'm, I'm not sure what the, the current state of, um, of the channel is. I won't give you the, the numbers per se. Um, one of the um, one of the challenges we saw out of Spring Rush, obviously with the delays and off um, off campus, was um, uh, I guess less people in the in the store, um, and so it changed a little bit. Now there's a mix between POS and web in regards to to each of those ones, but I don't know that we have a good run rate yet. I think the macro. Um, COVID is still it makes it difficult to get a, a good bead on what exactly the entitlement number is. Um, it was, um, I guess, as a percentage, it was it was less in um, in spring than it was in fall, primarily due to that um, environment that we're in. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure that I can provide a good framework for you to, to give you a percentage to, to help you with your your. And that all we're trying to do is, um, you know, be there for students and continue to um, get our product in front of them and, and build awareness and um, take advantage when they're in the store and help them when they're, they're online. Yeah, yeah, I understood. And it, it sounds like that, that channel still has some upside as things get back to normal. So that's, that's mainly qualitatively what I was interested in. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for taking my questions and, and good luck. Thanks, Rory. Appreciate it. We currently have no further question on the line. I will hand over back to Andy Milebock for any final remarks. Great. Thanks, Juan. And thank you all for joining us on today's call and your continued interest in BNED. Please note that our next scheduled financial release will be our fiscal 2022 fourth quarter earnings in late June.
Thank you. This concludes today's call. Thank you so much for joining. You may now disconnect your lines.